Hello, Brad TV. We are so honored to be a part of your team, international team here in Israel. And I'm so honored personally to be able to share from God's word on Brad TV and to develop a friendship with Brad Kim and with you on the staff of the Brad TV. 10th anniversary. I bless you to have not 10th, but 80th anniversary. <laughs> and that all of you will be healthy and strong and, and useful to the kingdom of God and continue to bless Israel and to stand with God's word and bring good news to the Korean people from the Bible and from Israel. We greet you. Shalom. B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Keep you healthy and strong financially and physically and spiritually and in every way. And I hope to be alive in 10 years and to bless you again for the 20th anniversary of Brad TV. Shalom from Jerusalem. Hello, this is Richard and Caroline Hyde with just a few of our 18 grandkids. Wow. And we want to thank you guys so much for your love and your prayers and your faithfulness uh, and just being good stewards. Thank you. Yes, we love you all at Brad TV. We are so grateful for you and for your faithfulness and your kindness to us. And these are actually some of Ariel and Shayla's children who you know. And so, what do you guys have to say? They just said, thank you so much, Brad TV. We love you. We love you. Bye-bye. Shalom. Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, brace for attack, Israel on the brink of all-out war with Iran. We'll hear analysis from Alex Trayman, Chuck Holton, and Ambassador Michael Oren. Plus, a Druze IDF officer articulates his pride in Israel and the care the IDF takes to protect civilian life. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. From Tehran to Tel Aviv, the Middle East is anticipating an attack on Israel by Iran and its proxies. It's expected Israel's response will be much bigger than in the past. Here's the latest. In Tel Aviv, CENTCOM Commander General Michael Carrilla met with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. His mission? To oversee a coalition to defend Israel from an expected attack by Iran and its proxies. Meanwhile, in Tehran, the Secretary of Russia's Security Council met with Iran's president, who described Russia as a key and strategic ally, and said improving relations with Russia is among Iran's top foreign policy priorities. Iran's foreign minister also blamed the U.S. for supporting Israel's war against Hamas. Moreover, the U.S. should not provide Israel with arms or weapons of mass destruction. We believe that had it not been for the U.S. government's assistance, Israel would never have taken such a risk. On Monday, several American servicemen were wounded when Iranian-backed militias attacked the U.S. al-Assad air base in Iraq. The U.S. State Department is urging Iran to de-escalate. We have uh, been sending consistent messages uh, through our diplomatic engagements, encouraging people to communicate to the government of Iran uh, that escalation is not in their interest and that we will defend Israel from attacks and that uh, escalation does not serve Iran's interest. Most of Israel right now is anxiously awaiting whether or not there will be an attack, what it will be like, like and whether the IDF has the uh, capacity to defend it. 
Alex Trayman, Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS.org, believes the U.S. is sending the wrong signal to Iran. It seems clear that the United States wants to help Israel to defend itself. It doesn't want Israel to uh, absorb uh, large attacks on its home front. But at the same time, they are willing to let Israel fight but not win uh, the war. And it's giving Iran the sense that they don't maybe don't have a green light, but they at least have a yellow light uh, to go ahead and attack Israel. Trayman believes the U.S. needs to send a different message. What they should be saying is you will not attack because if you attack, we will consider it like an attack on the United States and we will punish you severely. Right now, there is not a very credible military threat, so there is no deterrence against Iran. In light of the peril Israel is facing now, 300 Christians from Indonesia came to pray in Jerusalem's garden tomb. They came to intercede for protection for the Jewish state and its people. I'm here in our studio with Chuck Holton, CBN News war correspondent. Uh, Chuck, we just saw in our story 300 Indonesians at the garden tomb worshiping and praising God and also praying for Israel. How important are these armies of spiritual soldiers in the battle right now? Well, uh, think about this. What You've got... We're in a war zone, theoretically, at least, and we've got people from around the world who are flying here, coming into the war zone, specifically to pray for the peace of Israel. And I, I mean, that's that's the most powerful thing mm -hmm. that any of us can do. Yeah. So uh, fascinating to see, and I've seen it myself when we went there for Easter. There are people from all over the world. There are people from the Philippines and just everywhere that had come to stand with Israel. And I just think that that's a very special thing. Yeah, and how about for people that aren't here physically, they can still stand in the gap for Israel? Of course, yes, you don't have to be here to pray for Israel and we're commanded to do so. Yeah. And how important, how key are they in the battle now? Well, I think it's the most, like I said, the most important thing we can do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's more important than, the, because this is a spiritual war, uh, then the, the kinetic battle space, the information battle space, those are secondary. Yeah. It's the spiritual battle space that we need to worry about. And people all over the world are doing just that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of this, the physical battle space, uh, General Cruella is here. He's the head of CENTCOM. What would he be doing right now? Well, he's, of course, you know, interfacing with his uh, peers here in Israel, but he's also going to Jordan and he's talking to them, trying to make sure that they're behind Israel like they were in April. And uh, we saw uh, several cargo aircraft, U.S. military mm -hmm. cargo aircraft that landed in Jordan yesterday. Uh, most likely that's because they're delivering something to Jordan. If you had to guess, you'd think they were probably delivering extra ammunition for their Patriot missile batteries because Jordan has some American mm -hmm. Patriot missile batteries. And remember, there are U.S. troops in Jordan. There are U.S. troops in Iraq. There are U.S. troops in Syria. And they are all at th uh, under threat right now. We saw yesterday exactly. an Al Assad Air Base in, uh, in in Iraq, some American troops wounded by uh, missiles that were mm -hmm. fired in there, and old missiles too. Uh, but uh, this is the scourge of the Soviet Union that never goes away. Those uh, munitions that they spread all around the world are durable and fungible, and they pop up in the darndest places. Mm -hmm. So um, they, we need to be praying for our, our troops yeah. that are in harm's way as well. And they're, they're anticipating likely a larger attack than what happened in April. So this is what Cruella is doing to, uh, to really make sure that all the pieces are in place. That's right. You know, there's a lot of moving parts and uh, we have to, uh, number one, deconflict uh, our forces with Israeli forces and the other forces that are in the region. So we, well, the worst thing we could happen would be for uh, it, Iran to fire missiles, a United States plane goes after those missiles, and an IDF plane or an IAF plane sees the American plane and thinks it's a, yeah. a, an enemy and tries mm -hmm. to shoot down their own people. Right. So they have to coordinate all of that stuff and deconflict. And you can imagine there are literally hundreds of thousands of moving parts in something like that. And there is a lot of AI that helps. There's a lot of computer stuff that, that kind of interfaces together. But even still, there's a lot of room for error in there, human error especially. And so that kind of coordination is vital in a time yeah. like this. And how would you describe the state of readiness of the IDF right now? Well, they're more ready than they have been 
in a long, long time. Uh, they've been training and preparing for an all-out war in the North. Uh, I think they've been waiting to go hard in, or to go physically into uh, Lebanon simply because of three things. Number one, uh, they want to better train and prepare their troops for that fight mm -hmm. because it's going to be a much more difficult and a much different fight than what they've encountered in Gaza. Number two, they want to uh, have time to build up their forces uh, or build up their equipment and ammunition and uh, their technology. So they have this iron beam technology mm -hmm. that is coming online and it can't come online fast enough. And if they can get uh, enough of those out and deployed into the field, that could be a real game changer for Israel if it comes to a massive wave of missile and rocket and drone attacks mm -hmm. from the north. Uh, the third thing I think that they're kind of looking at is just the US uh, presidential election because they want to know how much support they're going to get from the United States. And it's going to be a big difference between a Trump presidency and a Harris presidency yeah. uh, as, as to what kind of support they get. Yeah. So they would like nothing more than if they have to go into Lebanon to be able to push it off at least past the election and even better into next year, spring or something of yeah. next year. But uh, they may not have that option. The, the clock is ticking and uh, the, their, their window is shrinking day by day and likely shrinking much faster than they would like for it yeah. to be. Well, Chuck Colton, great analysis and uh, great to have you here in the land. Me too. I'm glad to be here. Coming up, analysis from Alex Trayman, Jerusalem Bureau Chief for JNS.org. As the Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, Alex Trayman has his finger on the pulse of events in Israel and the country's position on the global stage. We asked him about this moment in Israel's history and its relationship with the U.S. Alex Trayman with uh, Jewish News Syndicate, thanks for joining us. You posted something on your ex account uh, from Richard Goldberg where he makes a lot of points about, uh, you know, this current situation. Why did you think that was so important to, to repost? Well, the United States is basically saying, you know, we don't know whether Iran is going to attack. We hope it doesn't attack. If they attack, you know, we will try to defend Israel. What they should be saying is you will not attack because if you attack, we will consider it like an attack on the United States and we will punish you severely. Right now, there is not a very credible military threat. So there is no deterrence against Iran. The United States has the wherewithal to provide that deterrence uh, or even even just to say, we will not hold back Israel from doing whatever they need to do to repel your attack. Uh, they're not doing that either. So they're they're not only not putting their own military threat on the table, but they're trying to uh, take Israel's military threat off the table. And it's giving Iran the sense that they don't maybe don't have a green light, but they at least have a yellow light uh, to go ahead and attack Israel. Uh, has this been the story uh, with Israel and the U.S. almost since October 7th? Pretty much, yes. Uh, you know, it's, it seems clear that the United States wants to help Israel to defend itself. It doesn't want Israel to uh, absorb uh, large attacks on its home front. But at the same time, they they are willing to let Israel fight but not win uh, the war. And they don't want Israel or they have not allowed Israel to reestablish the deterrence that's necessary to uh, restore calm in the region. How would you describe perhaps the attitude of Israel right now in terms of what kind of response they might have? For example, in April, their response to uh, that attack on April 13th, 14th was pretty muted. What kind of ex do you expect from Israel now? So exactly. On April 13th, Iran sent over 300 uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and drones uh, at Israel. And uh, there was more than 95 percent interception rate between israel the united states and, and other allies in the region that all worked hand in hand to repel those attacks uh you know israel thought that this was a red line and they needed to respond it was the first time iran had directly attacked from its own soil uh and joe biden at the time told israel to quote unquote take the win and, and not really to respond so israel did uh respond with a very muted response they attacked the, the near the ifsahan nuclear site and they hit 
hit a missile defense system, which was basically there to, which was basically made, that counterattack was made to demonstrate uh, the long arm of the law of Israel, but to, to show them that they can reach targets deep inside Iran, uh, but at the same time was muted to the extent that it wouldn't cause a counter reaction. Uh, at this point, the fact that they're willing to attack again demonstrates that the deterrence has not been restored. Uh, and I think that uh, Israel is is very, very likely to uh, respond uh, much more fiercely. At the same time, the United States is trying to uh, keep Israel from doing that. Final question, Alex. What's at stake right now here in the Middle East? Well, you know, Iran has destabilized the Middle East for decades. So they, they've completely destabilized Yemen. They've destabilized Iraq. They've destabilized Syria. They've destabilized Lebanon. And they've destabilized Gaza. You know, everybody talks about Israel. Uh, Israel is trying to transform the Middle East. And the formula for doing that is, is simple to define, but it's difficult to carry out. The first is to defeat the terrorists. And the second is to normalize uh, with the moderate actors. And Israel has been engaged in both. Israel has been carefully uh, trying to to degrade Hamas's capabilities in the Gaza Strip. Israel will now shift uh, much of its focus towards uh, the north and try to degrade Hezbollah, which is likely to uh, participate in, in the strike that Iran is planning right now. Uh, you saw that the United States uh, and uh, the UK and Jordan all urging their citizens to leave Lebanon because they understand that Israel is now going to shift its focus towards the north and to remove Hezbollah, which is Iran's strongest terror proxy. Uh, but Israel must degrade the, the terror capabilities of the largest state sponsor of terror, which is Iran. That's to, to cut off the arms of that of the, the octopus his tentacles, which is, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, and others, and, and also to uh, demonstrate to Iran directly that uh, their malign activity in the region is coming to an end. And that's the only way to restore peace in the Middle East. Yeah. Alex Treman with JNSnews.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Up next, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. turned soldier, Michael Oren reports from the northern border. When America was deciding whether to fight for independence from Britain, one of its greatest thinkers, Thomas Paine, accused some of not being willing to fight for their country. He called them sunshine soldiers or summer patriots. It's not the case with Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren. He spoke to us from his posting on the northern border, where he and others like him are in harm's way in defense of Israel. Tell us why you're in uniform and where are you right now? Well, I'm serving with the, uh, the emergency squad of Kibbutz Kfar Blum, which is up in the north. Um, the north of Israel has been under uh, almost constant rocket and uh, drone fire uh, from Hezbollah uh, from the beginning of October. Uh, almost 100,000 Israelis have been displaced and uprooted from their homes, uh, cut off from their from their livelihoods. Those Israelis who haven't been displaced uh, remain here, again, under constant fire, constant threat. A young man was killed uh, a couple days ago just up the road for me on another kibbutz uh, by an unmanned armed vehicle, uh, flying vehicle. And uh, so there's a level of danger here, which is very, very high. Um, and, and nobody knows where the end is. No one knows how this uh, constant threat ends and whether uh, these 100,000 Israelis will be able to return to their homes, whether the other Israelis who have been under fire will be able to resume their normal lives. Um, and uh, the hope here is, the expectation is that there, there will be an end, that Hezbollah will be uh, pushed back from the northern border. No one can go back to the situation that existed on October 6th, when Hezbollah was literally on the other side of the fence. You can almost touch the Hezbollah positions. Nobody can go back to that, knowing that as we do now, what terrorists can do uh, to populations who are on the other side of the fence, they will cut through that fence. And no fence, no matter how sophisticated and strong, uh, can stop them. So they have to be pushed back. Uh, and we're waiting very anxiously. We would just very much expect uh, the world to understand our plight, to understand that we didn't start this war, we didn't want this war. It was thrust upon us by Hamas and by Hezbollah. And that Israel has to take every possible measure to defend its citizens. And what we're getting up here at the end is literally 
We are defending uh, our citizens here. Um, just a last note, in the aftermath of the elimination of these two mass murderers, people who have murdered not just thousands of Israelis, but also a countless numbers of Palestinians and Americans, and Americans, we really would appreciate it if the world voters said thank you, Israel for eliminating these two truly evil individuals and not come us with with, it, with complaints that, you know, and somehow Israel's endangering peace in the Middle East. You've been an ambassador, you're, you're dealt with world leaders. What kind of international support uh, is you would expect or hope for uh, up in the north and, and also the other threats that is, Israel's facing on all fronts? We expect very great support, the support, unfortunately, which you're not getting. Uh, the United States has said that it will defend, help defend the state of Israel. And what does defense mean if Israel's attacked? But Israel's been attacked. We've basically been in a war uh, with Hezbollah, not just with Hamas, but with Hezbollah since October 7th. And uh, the message that I received both you know, here and in Washington, because I go to Washington fre frequently, I'll go to Washington again next week, is that uh, you know, Israel's, they expect Israel to defend itself passively, maybe till we run out of uh, Iron Dome interceptors. Um, but I haven't seen any major support for counteroffensive action that would drive Hezbollah away from the fence, that would truly deter Hezbollah and deter Iran. Which brings me to the next big point. Who's willing to stand up to Iran? Uh, up to this point, no one's fired a shot at Iran. Iran has, uh, has uh, instructed its, its proxies to fire at American bases close to 200 times. Uh, Iranian proxies have closed the Straits of Mandeb to international shipping, uh, at the cost of countless billion dollars to the international community. N Iran has not paid any price whatsoever for this, and I'm strongly of a posi position that, of opinion that until is Iran is made, to pay a punishing price, it will continue to bring violence, instability, and war to the Middle East, and not just to the Middle East, but also to the world. When you go to Washington, when you talk to people from the West, what is your message to, uh, to Americans and uh, U.S. Uh, leaders? The message is Israel has not just the right, but the duty to defend its citizens in the South, certainly, but of course in the North, and that uh, Iran, Iran, a Iran which is close to this nuclear weapon, Iran which is um, activating proxies throughout the region to attack not just Israelis, but attack American bases, to attack international shipping. Uh, Iran must be stopped. It must be stopped. It's the, the head of the snake, the head of the octopus, whatever you know metaphor you want to use. At the end of the day, the Middle East will not regain stability. We will not avoid a war, war if Iran remains undeterred and unchecked. Still ahead, the melting pot that is the Israeli military and the painstaking care taken to protect civilians. Israel is often accused of racism and even operating as an apartheid state. The recent Hezbollah attack on a Druze minority community in the Golan Heights revealed a different reality. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl heard from a Druze Israeli father and son about their pride and how the IDF protects civilians and their hopes for peace in the future. Company Sergeant Major Eyal Ganam, a Druze Israeli, is an IDF commander in the Gavadi Brigade. He fought in the 2014 Gaza-Israel war and now serves as a reservist in the ongoing war. Ganam spoke to journalists in the Druze town of Majd al-Shams after a Hezbollah rocket killed 12 children as they played on a soccer field and wounded dozens. This is my message to the whole world because the world needs to understand this. Every time we need to do an operation, we always endanger ourselves. We put the highest risk on ourselves so we won't injure any innocent person. Ganam explains that for a military operation that should take just six hours, the IDF often spends 12 to 24 hours to avoid civilian casualties. This is exactly the reason why I personally believe that this war is taking so long. The reason is we're taking the time to think, to understand, and to attack against the ones who attacked us. About 150,000 Druze live in Israel, mainly in tight-knit communities. While Arabic-speaking, they are not Muslims and practice a unique religion. 
Ganam feels the Druze know the difference between good and evil. That is the way we as a population and community are always educated. Also in the idea of family, we're educated to do good things. Ganam also believes his people do not want war. We really try not to hurt the innocent, but to bring down all this terror that is taking place in the Middle East with the one goal, to reach the situation of peace. Many Druze are Israeli citizens serving in the military. Others, like most in Majdal Shams, choose residency over citizenship because they have relatives in Syria and Lebanon. As Israeli residents, they can travel more freely in the Middle East. Eyal's father, retired IDF Colonel Hamara Ganam, says he believes the trouble in the north is caused solely by Hezbollah and not the Lebanese people. Just Hezbollah move their country to war. And most of the communities in, in Lebanon, I'm speaking, I'm speaking about the Druze, the Christian, and the Muslims, Sunni Muslims, they don't want war because they don't, what is the result of the war? And they don't want to suffer because we know very well that uh, Hezbollah working according to the policy of Iran. In the meantime, Israel waits for Iran and its proxies to retaliate for the killing of senior Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, targeted after the Majdal Shams massacre. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Majdal Shams, Israel. Well, it's an important story. And that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember to follow us on social media and you can access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please continue to pray for Israel, for all those caught in harm's way, and for the hostages to return home. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.